Hello, my name is Mark Shepardidgeon, but please call me Shep. And today we're going to be talking about invasive species, those, uh, those organisms that leak into our country from other places and then just go nuts. So without further ado, here we go with invasive species. First, uh, we're going to spend some time talking about some of the terms that are involved. Um, and then we'll talk about what we can expect from invasive species. The first thing we should discuss is the term introduced species. Introduced species are simply non-native species of plants or animals, but something that's established itself as a reproductive population, something that's breeding, something that's growing. And that's an important part. Uh, you will hear them referred to as exotics at times, exotic, uh, exotic species. Um, but this is synonymous with non-native and it doesn't necessarily mean invasive. All it says is that they're here and they're breeding. So uh, we'll just take a look at uh, at the next next step up, once you have an introduced species, then uh, and understand, introduced species may have been brought in accidentally. And they may have been brought in deliberately, but regardless of how they got here, uh, they found our environment quite suitable, and they're successfully reproducing. Uh, examples actually include things like uh, like the honeybee. Honeybees were introduced for uh, apiculture, for honey and wax. And they, uh, they got loose, they got out, they're off on their own. And while we still have a huge apiculture industry, there are honeybees living on their own out there and they, uh, they're doing just fine. And they haven't displaced anything or they're, they're not particularly bad actors. Although some of the, there are some people who would say, yeah, they are. <laughs> and in fact that, uh, the honeybees are, are displacing some of our native pollinators, which uh, I certainly, I don't, I don't know about that. If they are, I haven't noticed, but maybe they have. Either way, uh, honeybees are an introduced species. Surprisingly too, you know, a lot of people have no idea that they're introduced, but yeah, they weren't here before. Now, if you want to see uh, other examples of introduced species, all you got to do is go to South Florida. There are, there's everything. There's monkeys and pythons and, and, and now there's even the, uh, a, a large monitor lizard. It's the uh, Argentinian black and white tegu. It's Argentinian because it's a, uh, it's, it's from Argentina uh, and a few other countries in South America as well. But this thing will uh, live for 20 years, I think, Some, something like that, a couple of decades, and get up to five feet long or thereabouts, and they're omnivorous. So they will eat anything they can fit in their mouths. They have a uh, predilection for uh, eggs. So without living exclusively on eggs, they're really hard on alligator eggs and gopher tortoise eggs and uh, um, land birds, land dwelling birds that put their, put their eggs in the ground. The tegus eat them and they may be very difficult to deal with. Uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission has, is very concerned and is um, busily working to see what they can do to limit the spread of this this particular uh, species. Now, invasive species are uh, introduced. Um, they become inter they become invasive when they start displacing the native species. It's one thing to be an introduced species, but when you start acting poorly, you may be invasive. And so, uh, with invasive species, what we're dealing with is an, an animal that no longer has the uh, predators and the diseases and the competing species that keep them in check in their native range and with nothing to stop the spread, it's off to the races. Uh, so just to review, not all introduced species are invasive, 
but all invasive species are introduced. I should point out at this point uh, that a species need not be from another continent or even a foreign country. Uh, there are some North American species that are considered invasive in other parts of North America. For instance, the, uh, the American bullfrog. Now, this is invasive in the Pacific Northwest. To us here in the East, it's just a big frog. But to them, it's like this gigantic frog that eats anything it can stuff in its mouth. And it's taken over. And closer to home, the odorous house ant, which is actually a native of the mid-Atlantic states, but it has been climbing out of its territory and expanding uh, farther and farther away. So as it gets farther into the Midwest, it's invasive and it's displacing other insects and it's becoming a, a, a real nuisance, a holy terror outside of its range. So just because a, an insect is native to one part of the continent doesn't mean it's, uh, it can't be invasive to another. What makes, a, what makes a species invasive is actually the effect that it has on its environment or its uh, ecosystem. If it comes into balance and stops displacing the native species or damaging crops or whatever it's doing, may be downgraded to simply an introduced species. In fact, most of us are unaware of the pests that were once considered invasive. So here's a riddle. This is going to be name that invasive pest. Now, that's a lot of words, so let's go through it slowly. This is actually from a USDA publication. The oh, mystery pest has come into prominence largely as a nuisance in and about human habitations rather than as an economic pest. A furtive insect with a foul odor and formidable appearance, the mystery pest, seems to have a proclivity for creating annoying situations, scuttling out from among the bed linens, lurking among foodstuffs, dropping upon the table from among cut flowers, marring choice ornamental plants, and falling in large numbers when an outer door is opened in the morning. Such occurrences drive the tidy householder to a war of extermination, entered into with a zeal all out of proportion to the actual damage for which the mystery pest is responsible. Can you, uh, can you guess it? It's it. It's a European earwig. <laughs> Who'd have thought that? Now, you got to admit, you knew that a European earwig was in fact uh, um, introduced. You would think that if it was native, it it wouldn't have the uh, it wouldn't have the name European earwig, would it? Now that's not to say that a lot of the names you see have no bearing on where it comes from, but it would be pretty odd to call in an insect that's native to North America a European anything. Does that happen? I can't think of any examples, but it 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 might be. I'm just, I'm just never, I'm just never surprised by anything anymore. But there you have it. The European earwig, an invasive insect, or at least it once was. And uh, that was when, this was over a hundred years ago. That was like 1910. And it was brought into, I believe it was Oregon. But by the time they figured it all out, it was Washington, Oregon and Northern California. And, uh, and they had thought this, this thing, this is going to be crazy. This is going to tear us all up but it didn't. Uh, and after, what, a few decades, things settled down and it became, let's call it less than invasive. Now it's an introduced species. Uh, there are times when you've seen a lot of earwigs, perhaps, but that just gives you an idea that once it comes in and becomes invasive, things don't necessarily have to stay that way. So if we look at the natural trajectory of an invasive species, we're going to see a familiar pattern. They ar arrive, harmonize. Uh, no, I said that wrong. 
they arrive, they thrive, and they harmonize. So what they want to do is achieve balance. Um, and once balance is returned to the environment, then all is good. Now, uh, you may be familiar with the term biocontrol. This is the practice of uh, introducing or releasing an organism for the purpose of controlling a pest. It's held by many to be the gold standard of IPM. And uh, theoretically, it's the perfect solution to an invasive pest. Now, there have been some smashing successes. A uh, predator or parasite uh, that has a controlling effect on the target species only and affects no need native species, what could be better? Nature isn't often quite so clean. It's one thing to bring a thousand ladybugs and release them in your garden to eat all the aphids, but it's quite another to release an exotic ladybug. It seemed like a great idea in the 20th century and there were a number of ladybugs that were brought in and released but things didn't go quite the way we thought they would. And over the years, some of those ladybugs are quite common now. And some of our native ladybugs, we did have, well, we do have native ladybugs. Some of them are getting exceedingly rare as they're getting pushed out by the introduced ladybugs. Does that make them invasive? I don't know. But let's consider the uh, precautionary tale of, uh, of Harmonia, Harmonia exeritis, or exeritis, if you prefer. This is the uh, Asian, multi the multicolored Asian ladybird, be no, the lady, the multicolored ladybird, no, the, the Asian, the multi, it has a big, long name. Not that there's anything wrong with big, long names, but it is the uh, Asian ladybug, we'll call it that. Harmonia was, uh, brought in uh, quite a while ago, in fact, as early as I, I think um, 19, 1916, a long time ago. So it's been coming in for a long time. So they were sure that it was a, that it was a good actor and a fine example of biocontrol. And they had it brought in to use for uh, pecan orchards and aphids that were on pecan orchards. But then in 1988, 1988, they started finding uh, wild populations of this thing around Louisiana. And uh, in small doses, Harmonia does a good job and plays well with others. But once it starts overwintering, it developed a whole new persona began eating a whole lot of things. It began, let's say, misbehaving. For instance, uh, ruining crops. Nobody would have thought, yeah, we brought that ladybug in to uh, control pests, but now it's a pest itself. Oh yeah, I'm afraid it's true. They grew so numerous and their habits became so damaging that uh, they were the source of a, a, um, a series of studies on how could this be. In fact, uh, Joe Kovach over at uh, The Ohio State University did a lot of work on these things. And he discovered they spent a lot of time, uh, once their populations were big enough, feeding on crops. Here's a, there's a picture from that particular study of uh, the uh, Asian ladybug feeding on grapes, uh, something else. They have what they call re reflexive bleeding. So if you bother this insect, it will exude a nasty liquid substance from the joints of its legs and some other areas. It smells bad and tastes even worse. It's a defensive, uh, defensive uh, secretion to be sure, designed to keep people from eating the ladybug. But it is just awful, and it, and it tastes really, really bad. Not that you would eat a ladybug, although well, one of the things I think Joe uh, had uh, had found is that there was a 
there was at least one radio station where the radio station concert. Uh, so they are a con contest. So they're gonna have a contest and to see who can eat the most ladybugs. Why would you eat one? Why does this work? I don't, uh, because people are stupid. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that because I, I know that there's people out there, you know, I'm, I'm not stupid. Boy, radio contests will make you guess, won't they? Uh, so they, they, they actually did that. These things taste awful and it smells awful. So if you're vacuuming up all the excess ladybugs, the, uh, the exhaust, now at the back end of your vacuum, it smells pretty bad. It's, uh, it is just awful. Beyond that, and uh, this particular report, actually, this was, a, this was an article in the American Entomologist uh, from 2004, I think, uh, showed that they will, they will bite you. A Asian ladybug will, will bite you and uh, open your skin. What's up with that? I, I thought these were the, uh, the very picture of innocence and beauty. Let's release thousands of them in our backyard. That's the difference. That's how biocontrol comes into invasive species. Now, I do understand that we have to adopt a balanced approach to controlling pests. We have to protect health and property, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't get out of bounds with everything else we're trying. So it, it doesn't hurt our environment it doesn't hurt the area around us so that we're not burning our house down to save ourselves. So uh, you use a pesticide. We understand that pesticides carry a risk with them. They do. Some last longer than others. Some don't last long at all. Some last a good long time. But however it is, we know where they are. And we know it's going to happen to them. You let a live insect go for biocontrol, you can't get it back. You cannot recall it. You can't kill them all. It is a permanent solution. So you better be, well, not you, because you're not doing it. But the people who release uh, insects for biocontrol have to be very certain that this thing is only going to do what they think it's going to do. Asian ladybug is an example of a species that, that they thought was okay. We've tried it before and it's okay. Changed. Just goes to show you, things that were once introduced become invasive. Things that were once invasive may become introduced. And so with, uh, with that in mind, uh, how do we how do we know? There's all these things out there that, are they native? Are they introduced? Do you know? Let's, at this point, let's play Notice the Native. <laughs> so I'm gonna flash a bunch of pests by you. Get out a piece of paper and write down the, uh, the, the pests that are native species that aren't introduced, but they're always there. Uh, so I'm gonna put them down or I'm gonna flash them across and you put them down uh, if they're native. Don't bother writing down the non-native ones. There'll be a couple of those. So native, non-native. Let's start with an easy one. If you, if you get this wrong, don't, don't even admit to having been here. All right, next up, German yellow jacket. Oh, yeah, clearly from Germany. Is it? Is it? Remember, I told you, you can't count on those names really telling you where they're from. Hey, man, Ant. Cigarette beetle. Very common. Cigarette beetle. The house mouse, 
okay, it's not an insect, but I didn't say they were all insects. I just said they were pests. So native, native, not native, house mouse. Pennsylvania carpenter Durant. Uh-oh, there's another uh, geographical appellation. I'll tell you, uh, maybe, maybe not. Native, not native. German cockroach. We should all know this. It's an easy one, I, I hope. Pharaoh ant. Red flower beetle. Roof rat. Hmm. It's not from Norway, is it? Roof rat, native, not native. The American cockroach. Okay, how'd you do? You ready for the answers? Got them all written down? Very good. Let's uh, let's go through these and and, uh, and pick out the uh, let's pick out the natives. Pennsylvania carpenter ant. Did you guess the Pennsylvania carpenter ant? It's a native, all right. At least I think it is. It's it's a native 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 species. So uh, which others? What else did you get? Oh, that's it. Those were all introduced species. And that just kind of goes to show you that uh, oh, very few of the common important pests uh, are actually native species. If you were pressed to think of one, what would you say? Yeah, subterranean, Eastern subterranean termite, native species. Did you know? that the Eastern subterranean uh, termite is a horrible invasive termite in other parts of the world, parts of South America, parts of, um, I think Europe, uh, just going nuts, tearing them up. And uh, we always thought of it's just a termite, isn't it? In our environment it is, but in somebody else's, that's where things can go a little bit awire. So, if all the introduced species uh, in, in North America vanished today, we might be looking for another job tomorrow. There's probably not enough native species to interact with to keep an entire industry like ours alive. We're, we're, what, we're focused on returning balance to the, to the forest, to the ecosystem and kind of bringing things back in from all these things that have come, come in from, from outside our country. So let's look at uh, some of the invasives that are uh, making the news these days. We're just gonna go through, uh, I guess what you would, what you would call a, a, ro a rogues gallery, some of, the, uh, some of the worst actors. And uh, uh, they seem to, do really well down in the south, but whoever makes it up this far north, well, more and more it's happening. So we need to be prepared. So we're gonna start with a kudzu bug. This is a, this is a bean platyspid. It's actually an insect uh, from a family that has no other North American representatives. That's right. There are, uh, there are no other platyspids in the, in the US, in North America, just this. So when it came in, it was really funny looking. It didn't look like anything else that we could imagine. Now the kudzu bug eats um, kudzu. Huh. Of course, uh, kudzu, for those of you who've never been south, kudzu is, uh, is an, uh, it's an invasive plant. It's not just an invasive plant. It's like the ultimate invasive plant. Uh, if, you, if you've seen these, these are 
like this is a picture of uh, kudzu barons. There's nothing there but kudzu. Those tall things that look like giant green leaf people. Those are what used to be trees covered by kudzu. They die. There are no trees that live through this. It will tear down trees, it will pull down houses, structures of any kind. It just grows over them until everything becomes kudzu. Now, uh, I would uh, I would point out um, kudzu actually came to us. Um, um, 1800s, of uh, 19th century, they brought it over to feed to livestock. They thought it would be good for erosion because you could uh, you could do all kinds of things with it. What an insanely bad idea! It takes over. It can't be stopped. There's nothing you can do, and it's uh, it's become invasive. Now. Uh, this is uh, from the from the um, kudzu kudzu website. Look at this. It is taken off, and you, as you can see, uh, it just um, it may be here any minute now. I actually haven't seen any kudzu up this way, but as you can see from the map, they found it. So we'll see what happens. Now the kudzu bug eats kudzu. So hey. This could work out well. And if the kudzu bug only ate kudzu, we'd be in good shape. But guess what? They learned to eat soybeans. Soybeans, a major crop in the East. So, soybeans are huge. We need soybeans to uh, feed, feed white-tailed deer. <laughs> no, we do lots of things with soybeans. Uh, it's a, it is a major crop. And they are going nuts on soybeans as well. So uh, they're not playing well, and they are expanding their range. They're uh, they're moving. Yeah, let's see, we got a map now. Not as far as kudzu yet, are they? But they are on their way. One thing to notice is that uh, while they do uh, come out in large numbers, they like a number of other. Uh, invasive insects, they become pests by trying to spend the winter in buildings, by coming into buildings, and they're just everywhere. They show up in every nook, every cranny, every closet. They show up all over the place, and that is the problem. So what can you do? Well, if you can't seal them out, and this is not a big insect. They can come in through some pretty small, uh, some pretty small openings, so it can be a problem. Such is the uh, such is the state of uh, invasive insects. All right, so that's the kudzu bug, and as you can see, just on the cusp of getting here. Uh, maybe a few years. Sometimes they slow down. Sometimes they start out spreading fast, and then they slow down, and then they kind of almost stop. But you never know, uh, like the earwig. So let's move on. Brown marmorated stink bug. And these are, everybody knows about brown marmorated stink bugs because, well, because, well, because they're brown and they're marmorated. Then they're stink bugs. Uh, this is a huge invasive that uh, damages crops and invades homes, just like the kudzu bug. Incidentally, so what is a, what is a marmorate, what's marmorated? What does that mean? Um, Marmorated means, it means marbling. So there's a, you can see the little dimples all over the, the back of this thing. That's, that's where it got its name because of that kind of marbled effect. It was found in uh, Allentown, PA, and uh, where it was, uh, it had been noticed in uh, 1998. And the nymphs don't look a lot like the uh, like the adults, um, but a number of stink bugs are like that. They start out with some pretty amazing markings, and as they get uh, as they get older, they look more and more like the adult until they 
come out no that's what that is now uh the adults look like many other stink bugs in fact here as you can see uh stink bugs have a very similar uh shape and appearance they actually get their name uh well not they get their name from uh from scent glands that cause them to stink but uh the family name is pentatomidae and the pentatomids are, are called that because the uh the scutum which is that uh, is this right here i don't know if we can see my uh if we can see my cursor i'm hoping so there's this uh home base plate looking thing on the back between the wings it's called, it's called a scutum and it is a uh, five-sided so it's it's a it's a pentagram so pentatomity there you go and now look as you look up and down you see well, they all kind of look alike, don't they? They all have a very similar shape. Now, there's a couple of things you should notice. Uh, some of these bugs don't look unlike. Um, okay, they look a lot unlike it, but in in different light, sometimes these these look a lot, look very similar. One thing's to notice: see the bands on the antenna, and notice how that band covers a joint, so it gets a little bit of this segment and a little bit of that segment. <clears throat> That's important. There are no spines on the shoulders, on these, uh, this margin of the pronotum. No spines, no spikes. You can see here, see the spikes, yeah, teeth. Mm -hmm. And then you see the little, uh, what are these? Little embellishments, no, little markings. That's what they are, festoons, I don't know. They're uh, this little decoration along the sides. You don't see that in, uh, many of the others oh let me see a little bit here so there are things to keep them apart but you should know that not every stink bug is a brown marmorated stink bug they uh they eat lots of different crops and uh they particularly enjoy apples and they're moving across the nation now as you can see uh from this map they're found almost everywhere but they're really a problem in some states. Uh, you should know they take a lot of fruit in the field and while they eat lots of crops, they they like soybeans also. Um, they're really hard on apples and uh, grapes and stone fruits, uh, peaches and plums. Now, as they uh, when they started out, which was in what um, Allentown, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, they got so bad in those just a few years after they started that they had entirely ruined apple crops in the area. In the years they've been spreading out, but they haven't uh, they haven't been quite as harsh on the uh, on the crops in the areas where they've gotten to. Now, it's easy for me to say I'm not an apple grower. And I imagine that there are uh, some growers in Michigan and Minnesota who would dispute them, perhaps Oregon, who would dispute that. But it really isn't as, as harsh as it was when they, <clears throat> when they first started. So um, it, this follows a pattern. They come in and they just tear things up. And as they move farther and farther in, the environment gets uh, more and more adept at dealing with them, getting used to them. So brown marmorated stink bug, and we certainly have those here. It took them a while to get here, but once they made it, we knew what was going on. This is the uh, Asian longhorn tick. I'll tell you, um, common names can be, can be really um, problematic, but Asian longhorn tick. What do they call it a longhorn tick? That's... Uh, it's probably not worth going worth going into. Actually, it uh, it has to do with the length of a small little piece of this uh, section of the head that doesn't look particularly long to us. Does to the tick people, so stands right out to them. But uh, the Asian longhorn tick, which came over to us from China, showed up on uh, showed up on some some sheep. Uh, not um, the kind of sheep you would have as as pets or a specialty specialty sheep, yeah. 
in uh, in New England, um, East Coast anyway. Anyway, and uh, they have been uh, been a problem because they exhibit parthenogenesis. Uh, parthenogenesis is the uh, the ability of females to produce young without the benefit of males. I know. Uh, I know you may have learned about the birds and the bees, but th this defies the laws of good taste. Can you imagine reproducing no males? That's just, that, that's horrible. I mean, think about it, a, a life without males, no beer, no sports, nobody to take dead things out. Parthenogenesis, we see this in a number of uh, organisms. The uh, and you may recognize the uh, the cockroach is the uh, is the Suriname cockroach, which is a pretty well established and introduced species in the uh, in the Gulf in the Gulf states Gulf Coast, which incidentally it is an introduced species, but it's not invasive. Um, the uh, there's a uh, uh, strawberry root weevil. Uh, which is uh, also parthenogenic. Don't, don't need males, they just lay eggs. There is a salamander, uh, Jefferson salamander, that has a population, a couple of populations, and I think one of them is in Michigan. No known males, it's just the, just the females. There's a number of other things that have, uh, that, that go through this. Aphids typically go, and we even have native aphids that go through this. Parthenogenesis, they just, just produce babies that produce babies that produce babies, and they're all clones of their mother. It just happens. Now, when you're doing this, uh, you can be prolific because you don't have to wait around for a, a special occasion to be able to produce young. You just produce them, and the only thing slowing you down is your food supply. So when this happens, uh, organisms can become prolific. And uh, the Asian longhorn tick is no exception. Uh, when you're around these, you, you don't just pick one up. You pick up dozens or hundreds. They reproduce quickly and uh, they can produce a pretty heavy tick load for uh, animals that are unable to get them off, um, there have been recorded deaths of livestock, think cows, by, uh, um, from exsanguination. Exsanguination. Exsanguination is a fancy word it, for saying uh, they sucked you dry. So many ticks. They took all the blood out of you and there was nothing left but a very pale cow. That's a lot of ticks. So it doesn't happen to people because we know better. We'll be, we'll be picking them off uh, before that kind of thing happens. But you should know it, they can really do it. Here's a, in the picture. And uh, this is the tick encounter. If you, uh, if you ever have questions about ticks, go to... Uh, TickEncounter.org, got some great stuff. Here you can see uh, uh, Asian longhorn ticks questing. Now you may have seen pictures of questing ticks where there's one tick that's out there and it's holding up, it's holding up, it's, wait, it's, waiting, for a, it's waiting for a ride by itself. These aren't by themselves, they're dozens. And so you, you pick up lots. And as you can see, that's a great way to get lots on you. And remember, they're parthenogenic. So once they, uh, once they get their meal, they begin to, to breed prolifically. Now, uh, it also makes for easy spread because you don't have to take too many to get things going. Um, our distribution on the Asian longhorn tick. Oh, look, it has been moving. Now, ignore the colors. The colors uh, um, indicate how they identified them because identifying these ticks can be, can be tricky. Uh, this is from uh, the uh, APHIS USDA site. 
But as you can see by the by the spots on the map, it has been moving and uh, they're showing up in Ohio and they're just about in Indiana. This could be bad. This is a bad animal. Um, there's a still some study and debate going on to decide what, if any, tick-borne diseases will be spread by the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, it certainly spreads some diseases where it comes from in Asia, but it's not known that it's, it's spread any diseases to, uh, to humans here on the, um, here in North America. But uh, exsanguination, that's going to be, that's going to be brutal. Let's go through one more. Uh, this is the Asian needle ant. Uh, you know, it used to be the Chinese needle ant, but now it's the Asian needle ant. Incidentally, uh, it used to be Brachycondyla chinensis, which means, which means a big, big spike from China. That's what it means. Uh, now it's Brachyponera, or is it Brachyponera? No, it's got to be Brachyponera. I don't know. I never know how to say those things either, so don't feel bad. Uh, chinensis, which means, uh, at Panera means evil. Did you know that? It means evil. So this is big evil from China. I don't name them. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, this thing has a quite a protracted stinger coming out the back end. One thing to notice, it is ponerine. It's a, it's a ponerine ant. It's from the subfamily <clears throat> that has, um, uh, has a number of ants that are all uh, vicious predators with voracious stings. No, they're voracious predators with vicious stings. They are, but they generally come from smaller colonies. And so we don't see them very often. They don't show up as pests. You may be familiar with Hypopanera, uh, which we find under the buildings um, and it's introduced, but it's not invasive. We find that uh, under, under buildings and such from time to time. And they don't have large colonies, but when they swarm, they swarm by the thousands and uh, the swarmers will sting and that That'll really put people off their feet. So, but this is a ponerine ant. If you look, the first thing you do is you uh, is it got one node or two. And you look at this and you go, oh, that's one node. That's a heck of a node, ain't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, and some of these, it's hard to even recognize it as a node. It's kind of uh, kind of misshapen. This wasn't supposed to be in that one node or two key. Um, if the key is good, it will put this under one node, but, uh, Strictly speaking, um, it's a it's it's a it's a little different than that. So, um, the Chinese uh, Chinese the Asian Asian needle ant get it right Asian needle ant. Um, fortunately, uh, where they go, they are um, they generally uh, nest in away from uh, from humans. You find them in. In rotten logs, you, any place where there's a lot of these, go out in the woods, kick open a rotten log, you'll find uh, Asian needle ant. They, they don't aggressively come in buildings and sting people. Um, not like fire ants, not like, uh, not like some of these others, but they do sting and they are vicious stings. So it's not good. And people will notice, people will know when they get them. So, uh, it's, it's important to understand where this ant is and, and what it does. Uh, as you can see from the map, they are on their way. They are, uh, they are in fact, they're, uh, they're almost here. Um, they are officially in Indiana as of May. <clears throat> so if you get a report of a stinging ant, it might be the needle ant. I should say, you know, you get a report of a stinging ant. There could be a number of ants that do that. Um, we may be seeing uh, fire ants. Moving up here? No, but uh, certainly getting brought in, brought in on, uh, on nursery stock, nursery stock, nursery stock, in, in tree root balls and things like that. You can bring them in and they have, they have shown up in places that they shouldn't be and won't survive, but they show up there anyway. So when you get uh, 
when you get a report of stinging ants, go out first, identify the ant before. There's another, um, is, it the, is it a European fire ant? Myrmica rubra. It's a whole different, whole different ant. And uh, su supposedly uh, started in the, uh, started in the, in Canada, Canada in the east and has moved across the, the, um, the continent. Um, but it reported in Michigan, never seen it. So just because you're introduced doesn't mean you're invasive. Keep your eye out. Stinging insects can be anywhere. And uh, needle ant, that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. All right, what's up next? <laughs> the uh, spotted lantern fly. This is the latest and greatest. This is the next, this is the new kid on the block. It's, uh, it's a spotted lantern fly. Now do note, lantern fly is one word and that's because it's not really a fly. It's a bug, it's a, it's a hopper. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's, um, it's, it's related to plant hoppers and those kinds of things. Now, uh, the spotted lanternfly, and you look at that bright red underwing, that just stands out. It's actually a pretty good looking animal one, all things considered. But when you see what it does, <clears throat> it can be ugly. Now, it's a, it has become an agricultural pest because uh, they can attack a wide variety of plants, but they're particularly fond of uh, Alanthus, the, uh, the tree of heaven, or uh, what Chinese sumac or something they call it, Look, looks like this tree of heaven, which is, ready, drum roll, an invasive plant, they taken over, pushing out our native plants. So no, so now we've got another invasive pest to come in and eat the invasive plant, which would be all right if that's all they did, but they don't. They eat lots of things and they will show up in yards um, in uh, high numbers. So every tree looks like this. And uh, because they're, uh, they're plant hoppers, they're bugs, they produce honeydew, which you may know to be a, a a sticky substance that uh, attracts ants and makes everything sticky, except for the ants. It doesn't make them sticky, but it makes everything else sticky. And once that gets sticky, the dirt sticks to it. And now everything looks dirty. And uh, people will not be standing for that, especially when it's a car, because the uh, honeydew can, can mar paint jobs. It, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty awful stuff. So you get heavy populations of these, they will hurt the plants. They will make everything nasty and you'll, you'll be getting a call. Now, they're just, they're just getting into, uh, into our area. So it's, um, I would say they're not quite here. Although I would say that uh, we found them in Michigan this year, mm, not very far from where I live in fact, but nobody called me. So, I think they just came and they dug and they burned until they thought everything was was gone. They will work hard to keep these from moving because, again, uh, not just a household pest, an agricultural pest that doesn't just hurt people's um, what their dignity and way of life hurts hurts their uh, their way of living. And uh, when it gets in the way of that, that can be that can be tough. These are just some of the invasive species that are out there. And you might be sitting there wondering, well, that's all well and good, but what do we do? Well, uh, what do you do? And that would be the question. What do we do when they get here? What do we do when they start ringing the phones and we got to go deal with spotted lanternfly or uh, brown marmorated stink bugs or such? Well, the first thing to do learn about the pest. In a minute, I'll show you some, uh, some websites to start with. But the first thing you got to do is learn about the pest. S start with the bug. Dave, Dave Miller always said that. Start with the bug. It's where you should start. That's going to make all the difference in the world. S see a bunch of insects on something? Well, this might kill them. No. What are they and why are they there before you, before you do that? Figure that out first. Now, I should should 
warn you it's because sometimes it it may be as easy as um cutting down a cutting down a tree or two that this is all of your problem and once we remove these they're gone it could be uh it could also be that uh if you were going to try and uh, try a little um <clears throat> uh, some chemistry um and get a pesticide to, to do the work you should know that most of these pests are not on the label um but I would point this out, and you should know this if you have a uh, if you're a certified pesticide applicator, you should know that there's a provision in FIFRA, Section Two Double E, which talks about um, when is it um, when is it not a violation to uh, go beyond label directions, and uh, so they they talk about that, um, and one of them is the pest does not have to be on the label if the site is on the label. So there's a bunch of insects on the exterior perimeter of this house, but they're not on the label. If treating the exterior perimeter of the house is on the label, section 2EE says you can do that. Uh, let, let me be sure to point out and make very, very clear at this point, um, not all states allow section two double E. I know it's federal law, it's FIFRA, but the, uh, the agencies that oversee that particular law, the Department of Ag, Department of the uh, um, Indiana State Chemist and those kinds of things, um, they have to follow the rules that have been promulgated by the state. And not all states allow two double E. Indiana, uh, Michigan and Ohio, I believe, are are most states are, but not all of them. Um, I think New York, you have to the manufacturer has to apply specifically per product for a, for a product to be two double E. No, nope. don't take my word for that. Um, you should know the laws in your own state as to what what it allows and whether or not you're a two double E state, because that will decide whether or not you. Uh, oops, that will decide whether or not you're able to use a product. Uh, for an unlabeled pest or not. Again, the most important thing to do is learn about the pests. If you've got a pest you don't recognize, you need to confirm that ID. You need to get a good ID on it. Um, I know a lot of very smart entomologists, but I don't know any of them who know all the bugs. There's too many. So no matter uh, how pointy your head is, there's going to be something you don't recognize. And that's when you take it to someone who does. Find out, uh, find out where you can take things and get stuff identified, whether it's at the <clears throat> local cooperative extension um, here at Purdue um, <clears throat> or at the cooperative extension in the uh, land grant university nearest you. You can go to online to some of these things and uh, you got to get a proper identification for anything you think may be introduced, may be invasive, so that you can uh, so you can learn about those things. So that brings us uh, to the point of questions. So if you have any questions, I'll see you at the Q and A session. Thank you. <laughs>